Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Hoffman, director of UC Berkeley's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And welcome to this conversation. This is the last in Ali's fall speaker series. And today we have Cynthia Gorney and David Qualman, who will discuss the scientific race to defeat COVID and David's book, Breathless, which was published this month. A word about Cynthia Gorney. She is an author, a journalist, and professor at UC Berkeley School of Journalism. Her writing career began at the Washington Post, which, where she was recognized as an award-winning national features writer. In the early 1980s, she was the South American bureau chief for the Washington Post, and then a bit later, the author of Articles of Faith, A History of the Abortion War. Cynthia has been a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, and many others. On KQED Forum or at Herb's Theater or here at Berkeley, we have enjoyed Cynthia's conversations with experts, authors, writers, and scientists. Today, Cynthia will introduce our guest conversant, David Quammen, and begin the conversation. Cynthia Gorney. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for giving me a chance to talk about this amazing book with my colleague and old friend, David Quammen. Um, how best to introduce David? Um, you should plug your ears for a minute. I'm going to talk you up quite a bit. David is regarded by <laughs> those of us in the business as perhaps uh, the most distinguished, um, most readable science writer working today. This uh, Breathless is his 17th book, but he has a career that has spanned magazines, book writing, column writing. Um, we met as colleagues at National Geographic, where I have looked up to him as sort of my older sibling in the adventures of National Geographic for more than a decade now. He's usually to be found gallivanting around uh, small airplanes in Africa or, or on a ship. I tried to get a hold of him once and he said, I'm sorry, I was in the hold of a naval, a Russian naval vessel going through Siberia. I said, that sounds about right. Um, his newest book, Breathless, The Scientific Race to Defeat a Deadly Virus, I will tell you right now, in my judgment, reads like a thriller. And we're going to talk about the book, um, about his very interesting experiences reporting it, um, making it unlike anything he's done previously, and uh, a number of other things. Uh, so David, welcome. It's a delight to have you, at least virtually, in Berkeley Thank with us. Thank you, Cynthia. Always great to talk with you, visit with you, Sister Cynthia, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this today. Um, David, I'd like you to start not with Breathless, but with your, uh, not your the last book before Breathless, but the penultimate one, I think we would say, Spillover, um, which I had occasion to read as the definitive account of a kind of viral transmission that I didn't even understand um, existed. I remember that I was working at the time on a story about Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and you were my textbook uh, at that point. Um, Tell us a little bit about what Spillover is about, why it's relevant profoundly to what we're doing right now. Um, and if you would do me the favor of reading that first graph on page 21 and explain why it's so important for what we're, we've been experiencing over the last couple of years. First graph on page 21, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Spillover is about a category of diseases known as zoonotic diseases meaning animal infections that are transmissible to humans. And it can be viruses, and a lot of the most problematic and most dramatic of these are viral diseases. But it could also, I mean, bubonic plague was a zoonotic disease caused by a bacterium that was, that was carried by fleas from rodents onto humans. Uh, so... A large fraction of all human infectious diseases, like 60%, are in this category in the strict sense, zoonotic diseases caused by pathogens that spill over, that's why the title, spill over from non-human animals into humans. And in the broader sense, if you figure it over thousands of, thousands of years, um, all of our 
diseases, infectious diseases or zoonotic diseases, because we're a relatively young species and everything comes from somewhere. So our pathogens had to come from other animals. Uh, and the subtitle of the book is Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. It was published in the US in 2012. And yeah. people said, oh, oh, Kwame, that's quaint. You're writing about viruses and things that jump from bats and other creatures into humans, Ebola and Nipah virus and Hendra virus and these obscure things that lay out on the fringe of medicine. That's cute. Um, and then 10 years later, eight years later, they came back to me and said, how did you, how did you know this was going to happen? How did you predict this was going to happen? And I said, I listened to the scientists. So read us that paragraph, David, and then I want to ask you. Which one? The one that begins, it's a mildly technical term? Yep. Start with zoonosis. Right. Right. So we it's understand. Mild... Okay. Uh, this is the beginning of the third little short numbered section. Um, <laughs> excuse me. It's a mildly technical term, zoonosis, unfamiliar to most people, but it helps clarify the biological complexities behind the ominous headlines about swine flu, bird flu, SARS, emerging diseases in general, and the threat of a global pandemic. It helps us comprehend why medical science and public health campaigns have been able to conquer some horrific diseases, such as smallpox and polio, but unable to conquer other horrific diseases, such as dengue and yellow fever. Um, parentheses, smallpox and polio are not zoonotic diseases. Uh, they exist only in us, but unable to conquer these other horrific diseases such as dengue and yellow fever. It says something, this word, something essential about the origins of AIDS. It's a word for the future, destined for heavy use in the 21st century. Wow. So you're writing that in what, 2011, right? Book comes out in 2012, that right. spillover. Right. All right. So take us to December 2019, which if I have the calendar right, is when you first start getting an inkling that something big is coming out of China. Um, right. Can you both describe mm. how you first start hearing this and what's going on in your head, given the years that you spent listening to scientists predict that something like this would occur? Right. <clears throat> there is an email alert service called ProMed Mail, um, a nonprofit free subscription service for people interested in infectious diseases run by some very smart uh, medical scientists uh, and founded uh, 20, 25 years ago. I joined it about 15 years ago. Um, I'm one of 80,000 subscribers, and all of us 80,000 subscribers get these email alerts, bing, 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 popping into our email accounts, sometimes 10 a day, alerting us. There's a child in Ho Chi Minh City who has a severe respiratory ailment, and it's suspected perhaps to be avian influenza. There is an outbreak of lumpy skin disease among water buffalo in Malaysia. There is this, there is that. We get all these emails. There is MERS. There's a case of MERS on the Arabian Peninsula in some guy who kissed a camel. Very ill-advised thing to do. We get these things. Boom, boom, boom. And mostly you delete them because you're not interested in lumpy skin disease. You're not interested right now in MERS. So you delete these things. So this phenomenon started showing up on ProMed Mail on December 30th, thanks to the deputy editor, um, a woman named Marjorie Pollack, who picked up a signal from her sources um, on the evening of December 30th, 2019, after she uh, went back to her computer after dinner uh, in her her getaway house with her husband on Long Island. And she posted something on this in ProMed Mail, December 30th, 2019. Um, unexplained pneumonia among people in um, Wuhan, China, possibly transmissible from human to human. The following night, New Year's Eve, she and her husband finish a dinner out 
uh, in a dinner that's been interrupted by phone calls to her from people who have heard about this in, in Wuhan, China. And they go back to the house and instead of watching the ball come down uh, in Times Square, she goes back to her computer and scrapes the web some more and finds some more information and posts again, including um, a translation by Google Translate of a statement um, from the Municipal Health Commission in the city of Wuhan uh, that included the statement, um, this thing seems to be a virus resembling SARS, but it's not SARS, relax, it's not SARS and citizens need not panic. So any, anytime a government bureaucrat issues a statement saying citizens need not panic, you know something dark is going on. So she posted that. I'm getting these emails, but I'm getting ready to go to Tasmania to research another book. And I'm thinking about cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. So I'm not paying that much attention. And then it gets to be January of 2020. And I'm still not paying that much attention um, until about the middle of the month, at which point <clears throat> an op-ed editor from the New York Times emails me and says, hey, Kwaman, it's about time for you to do another op-ed for us on some subject of your choice, oh, maybe even this virus in Wuhan. And by that time, it had registered on me. And I said, yes, you bet. I do want to do an op-ed on this virus in Wuhan because this could be the next big one. This could be a pandemic. And I want to say that. That op-ed went up on January 28th. And then I went to Tasmania, spent a month with Tasmanian devil biologists in the bush, but got a lot of emails saying, hey, would you talk about this on media? So I went back to my emails, Cynthia, afterwards, asking myself the same question you just asked me. When did this register on me? And my ProMed emails had been deleted up until January 13th. So that's when this rang a bell with me. January 13th, Marjorie Pollack posted an email in which the subject line was coronavirus. At that point, it had been identified as a coronavirus. And I didn't erase that because when I saw the word coronavirus, that's when I knew this could be it. This could be the next big one because coronaviruses are among a few kinds of viruses that were at the actual, the absolute top of the watch list for scary viruses because they are very changeable, very evolvable, very adaptable to new hosts and therefore very dangerous. Do you remember people in the Bay Area sometimes, a lot of us have this sense whenever there's an earthquake, right? There's a, for a lot of us, there's a split second of, is this gonna be the big one? Is mm -hmm. this gonna be the big one? Do you remember a feeling like that at some point as you're collecting this stuff? Did you conceive how big, just how global it might become? Had that been part of your thinking when you were anticipating this in spillover? As soon as I saw the word coronavirus on January 13th, yes. And that's what I put into the op-ed on January 28th, saying this could be the big one. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said this, this could be a pandemic. Um, it could kill millions of people. I don't know if I specifically said that, but I was certainly thinking that. Yes. So there was after January 13th, there was almost nothing that surprised me about this. It was just, okay, here comes the worst case scenario. Boom, boom, boom. Happening just the way we who were following this subject knew that the worst case scenario could unfold. The, okay. only, thing, Go on. the only thing that was surprising was how, how, how inept the public health and national leadership responses were. That was what was surprising. So you make the point, and I, I think this segues from what you just said, you make the point somewhere in the text that um, s with SARS, um, I'm, I'm, it's, been so, it's, it's now been so long, SARS stands for Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome, right? That's severe, severe, severe Acute severe, severe, Respiratory right. Syndrome. It seems so huge at the time. Yeah. You make the point that globally, we dodged the bullet with SARS, and it might have been better if we had not. Can you explain, or some scientists believe, can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, and several scientists even used that phrase with me. 
talking about it and used it long before this thing began. Um, SARS-1, as we now refer to it, um, emerged in uh, southern southeastern China in late 2002, um, got from the city of Zhenzhen to Hong Kong um, in the body of a, of a man who had picked it up in his work as a doctor um, because a case had been admitted to one of the hospitals where he worked. He had been exposed. He was feeling ill, but nonetheless rode a bus to Hong Kong for his nephew's wedding, checked into the Metropole Hotel, it's no longer known as the Metropole Hotel, I got a room on the ninth floor, room 911, and then had some sort of a super spreader health crisis attack. Coughing, spewing, sneezing, whatever, maybe he vomited in the elevator, but people on that ninth floor got in infected. And it was a hotel, so of course they're out of towners. And so they get up the next morning and they get on airplanes from the Hong Kong airport and fly to Toronto, Beijing, Bangkok, I think also um, Hanoi, I can't remember exactly. And they take this virus with them and this virus spreads um, and starts infecting healthcare people who don't know that this is a very, very dangerous transmissible virus. So somebody is having a respiratory crisis and five, healthcare people crowd around trying to get the guy intubated and he's coughing and spewing and they're all getting exposed because they're not wearing personal protective equipment. Uh, it infects 8,000 people. It kills about 800, one in 10, a very dangerous virus, but it was not transmissible from asymptomatic cases. Ah. You got sick, you showed it, you coughed, choked, spewed, and then you started spreading the virus. And, and, and it was stopped, it was contained because it could be contained for that reason. And in about 2006, 2007, I'm on assignment for National Geographic to do a story on zoonotic diseases. They asked me, would you be interested in this? Oh yes, I just happen to be very interested in that. I'll be delighted to do a story. And so I went a number of places to do research, including to the CDC. And I talked to a number of people at the CDC, including one guy named Ali Khan, a very smart, funny, but serious fellow, infectious disease expert, uh, who at that point was deputy head of what was essentially their special pathogens branch, dangerous viral diseases in particular. And uh, he took me out to lunch after I'd interviewed people up and down the corridors in his, in his branch. And he said, okay, in his sort of jaunty gallows humor way, okay, Kwaman, you've talked to a lot of my people about all these various diseases. Which one is your favorite? Which one is my favorite? And I gave the entry level answer. I said, Ebola. Ebola is very dramatic. Ebola really is, is gruesomely fascinating to me. And Ali Khan, who had worked outbreaks of Ebola in Africa, who had seen people die, who was, you know, who had a big heart and great concern for people suffering from the, these diseases, but who also had this, this jaunty kind of sardonic humor, said to me, ah, I like Ebola as much as the next person, but to me, the one was SARS in 2003. And I said, really, SARS? Really, SARS? Yes, he said, that's the one where we dodged a bullet. He worked the SARS outbreak in Singapore. He was on the front line against SARS. He saw people dying. He saw this thing being passed as a respiratory virus with a high case fatality rate. Ebola is not a respiratory virus. It's not as transmissible. It passes in bodily fluids. So, um, so people knew. The experts like Ali Khan and others that, I, that I, we have been my sources, they knew that with SARS-1, we had dodged a bullet. And if you were going to create the nightmare virus um, causing disease X, you could do it in several hypothetical ways, but one of the best possible ways would be to take a coronavirus like SARS-1 and endow it with the capacity for transmission from asymptomatic cases. Bingo. 
Bingo. What, what we got. So let's move let's move into into sort of full pandemic time. Um, you talked about the ineptitude. Well, let me let me back up. When you decided to start recording this book, what was the how did you what was how did you decide ultimately that you would do it? You couldn't do what you normally do. Right. Um, so right. and that was what did that you was... decide to how did you decide to proceed collecting these stories? Well, so I came back from Tasmania. I spent about a month in Tasmania following Tasmanian devil biologists around in the bush, um, working toward this book on cancer as, as an evolutionary phenomenon, because Tasmanian devils have a genuinely transmissible, genuinely contagious cancer, not a virus that causes cancer, but a genuinely contagious cancer. It's supposed to be impossible, but it's not impossible. And it's the beginning of the conversation about how cancer behaves as an evolutionary phenomenon and can behave. So I came back from that on March 2nd. I had stuck some N95 masks in my briefcase before I left on February 6th, because I knew then that by the time I came back, masks might be mandatory on airplanes, but they weren't. So I didn't use them. Came back March 2nd to this room and in Bozeman, Montana, and heard soon from my publisher, Simon & Schuster, by way of my agent, the, the estimable, formidable Amanda Urban, um, that Simon & Schuster wanted a pandemic book. They could already see this is gonna be big. But they wanted a, on planes, right? I mean, they wanted a, yeah, they wanted a pandemic book and uh, they wanted me to write it. Uh, and I thought about that. Okay, do I wanna do a book on this pandemic? Thought about it carefully for four or five seconds. And then I said, yes, because I knew I had to say yes that this was not an opportunity, this was uh, an obligation. Um, so I said, yes, and I signed, they, they pushed the cancer book to the back of your desk, we'll give you a nice new contract for this, okay? So we signed this contract. So now it's late April or early May of 2020, and I've signed a contract saying, I will deliver them a pandemic book by December 31st, 2021, like six months, uh, a year and six months away, not long for a book for me. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to travel. I wasn't going to anytime soon going to be able to get on a plane for Wuhan and, and march through laboratories, let alone climb through caves with scientists there. And I knew that I was going to be writing a book about a subject that a lot of other people were going to be writing books about. And those are two violations of two of my cardinal operating principles, first of which is write books about things that other people are not writing books about. You know, molecular phylogenetics, horizontal gene transfer, island biogeography, uh, zoonotic diseases in, in 2012. So this is the opposite of that. This is gonna be a crowded field, of authors chasing the subject. And I was not gonna be able to travel. So you're doing and, your recording basically in that room, right? Yeah not, yeah, not even basically, just period, in this wow. room, using this laptop on this pile of five thick books to lift it up off my desk. Uh, this is where I've been for the last two and a half years, almost without exception. I got through, you know this from reading the book, I got through the rest of 2020 on one tank of gas. I did not leave Bozeman, Montana. Uh, and I spent the rest of 2020 trying to solve this tricky question of how do I do this book? Can't travel, can't go into the field, can't report on, on uh, outdoor adventures in jungles and things, tranquilized darting gorillas, et cetera. Can't do any of that. And how do I write a book that's unique and fresh in this field of books? And so I did what anybody would do if they were given that sort of impossible um, task and a deadline of December 31st, 2021, I scheduled myself for double knee replacement surgery. <laughs> oh, <David. laughs> and so I spent the summer of 2020 getting new knees, new titanium knees. And I wrote a few couple of pieces for our friend David Remnick at the New Yorker about aspects of the pandemic uh, and a few more op-eds for the New York Times. But basically I shuffled my feet um, trying to figure out how to do the book. Uh, don't tell Remnick that I said that writing for the New Yorker is a form of shuffling your feet. 
So uh, let me stop you. Let me stop you there for a second, um, because I want to move to a bunch of questions that I know are on people's minds as they think about um, all that you've learned, right, from all of these scientists that you sat in that room and and talked to and read the research of. Can um, I add one thing that though concisely before I, we do that? Absolutely, Cynthia. Um, sure. By the end of that year, I finally answered the question, how am I going to do this and how am I going to make it fresh? And I decided like uh, around um, Christmas of 2020, I'm going to do it by making the virus itself the central character. I'm going to write about the virus, its origins, its evolution, its fierce journey through the human population, and about the scientists who study it. I'm going to I'm going to do Zoom interviews with a lot of scientists who study this, and I'm going to ask them about the virus, about their work on on the virus, but also about their lives during the pandemic as persons, their lives as teachers, as lab leaders, as spouses, as parents, as children of elderly parents. And that's what I did starting January 1st, 2021. I'm interested in what you and the scientists concluded. There's, there's sort of two big areas that I'm gonna ask you to talk in uh, unreasonably tiny time about. The first is, what was the effect of the era in terms of social media and instant preprints on the way, and international trade, on the way that this virus took over and the way that we behaved? Well, did they of, talk to you much about that? In terms of the way the virus took over, am I freezing? You're freezing up a little bit. Am I still animate? Are our connection still good? Okay. Um, um, can you hear? Can you hear him, Susan? Uh, Max. Okay. All right. It seemed like there was a little problem with the co connection. So uh, the way the virus spread has everything to do with the fact of of how interconnected we are. I mean, it got to the Wuhan airport, uh, which is a big international airport, well connected to the rest of the world, and it went from the Wuhan airport to. Uh, to Singapore, to Seoul, South Korea, uh, to Seattle, to Milan. So pretty quickly, almost before we knew what was going on, this thing had seeded itself internationally and then proceeded to spread. And that I think is one of the reasons why Northern Italy was hit so badly. Northern Italy was really punished in, in the, the spring of 2020. I think because it, it got heavily seeded there through the Milan air, there are three actually, three international airports around Milan. And it got there because Milan is very well connected for business as well as for tourism to the rest of the world, including Wuhan, China. Wow. Yeah. So this virus got around the world before we know what was what was in the process of, of hitting us. Before my op-ed, among other things, went up in the New York Times, this virus was already in the US, in uh, Thailand, and in, in Milan, a number of other places. So we we just didn't didn't get around it quickly enough. Should have been should have been that when the words transmissible among humans and coronavirus were first spoken, there should have been massive international public health screening and and quarantine measures taken. And I expected that sort of thing which is why I took masks with me when I went to Tasmania, but it didn't happen, didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Well, not because we didn't have the science, but because we didn't have the imagination and the political will and the leadership to do that. Um, you know, we had, oh, don't get me started on political leadership. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I shouldn't go there. So, uh, and then information. Information was also flowing everywhere. And that was good. Preprints were going up. That was both good and bad. These things that scientists call preprints, which are drafts of journal papers that have not yet been peer reviewed and published in a scientific journal, but are just put up as manuscripts for discussion on websites that specialize in that thing, one called Bio Archives, one called Med Archives, and then there are a number of other places. And you don't need anybody's permission. You can just put it up and, and you know, it becomes a target on the wall and people can throw darts at it or they can 
benefit from it. But that was being done because, because this is an urgent situation. And to submit an article, a journal article to a scientific journal and have it peer reviewed and then finally published, it can take easily take nine months or a year. Didn't have that kind of time. So these preprints were going up. And some of the preprints were just wackadoodle, uh, you know, connecting this virus with uh, with a snake, there was this there was this one preprint that went up saying that, oh, the codon usage in this virus, which is a technical thing, but it's essentially the way that the 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 various different letters of the genome spell the amino acids that are created by a genome to make a protein. And there are several different ways to spell each amino acid. And the way these amino acids uh, were being spelled in this virus, um, looked to somebody like the way the spelling was done in the genome of a couple of snake species that exist in Southern China. So in, in, then in Edinburgh, tabloids within days, tabloids in Edinburgh were talking about the snake flu. The snake flu has arrived in Edinburgh. Okay. Craziness, misinformation, um, hysterical journalism, um, reporters and as you and I know, editors, editors write headlines. Reporters write stories and editors write headlines. And there were some really, really lousy, irresponsible headlines that were written um, on this story around the world. That brings us, um, and, I, and I know again, that we could spend an hour talking about this next question, but um, what did you end up hearing about the debate over origins? One of the things that I noticed in your book that was really, um, compelling to me is that you give pretty serious treatment to those who were arguing that this was a lab leak and not uh, a virus transmitted from animals. Um, so it's not a total, as you say, wackadoodle idea that comes out of nowhere. Can you talk just briefly about what you learned, why it's important to understand that, and what you ended up concluding on the basis of what your scientists had told you? Right. I'll try and give a very concise answer to that. It takes up a large portion of the book. It does. But, yeah. um, the way I see it, um, there are essentially two schools of thought about origins. There's the natural origins school of thought, and there is the nefarious origins school of thought. Natural origins is spillover from an animal, a, a virus, probably a bat virus that spilled over when it had an opportunity from a bat into some other sort of an animal that was part of the food supply chain going to the Wuhan market, and from that animal or several of those animals into people in the market. That's the natural origins school of thought. Nefarious origins encompasses, it's an engineered virus that evil scientists in a lab somewhere created on purpose to infect humans and then intentionally released it to do harm. That's the extreme form of nefarious origins. Or it's, it's a, a virus that may have begun as a natural virus in animals, but it was manipulated in the laboratory, in a, a laboratory with gain of function research of some sort, for some reason, possibly a legitimate or, or considered legitimate scientific reason, though perhaps reckless. And then once it was made a more dangerous virus, it accidentally leaked from a lab. <laughs> or it's a natural virus that was always dangerous and somebody brought it into their lab and grew it there, cultured it there, and then it leaked in that form from the lab. That's all, those are all versions of nefarious origins, okay? Um, it's very hard, as we all know, to prove a negative. So to prove that this was not a natural virus, first of all, the, the extreme version, it's an engineered virus. Um, the molecular evolutionary virologists on planet Earth that I trust most are unanimous or virtually unanimous in saying, no, you can look at this, you inspect the genome, this is not an engineered virus. This is a virus created by natural selection, which always involves a certain instance of, of, of chance. Um, it's, and, and I, I can go into details on that, but we, we don't want me to do that right now. Um, but an accidentally leaked virus that may have been, um, studied may have been you know passage through animals may have been manipulated in some form in a lab or just a natural dangerous virus leaking from a lab uh it's hard to prove a negative so it's hard to prove that this is not a, a virus that accidentally leaked from a lab however there is no positive evidence 
that it leaked from a lab because there is no positive evidence that it ever existed in a lab. And this virus, which we know now by the name SARS-CoV-2, it has about a 96% uh, resemblance by letter by letter through its 30,000 letter genome, about a 96% resemblance to um, a virus that, that had been identified, not grown in the lab, but identified from fragments sampled from bats and pieced together as a jigsaw puzzle, the genome, but not the virus, not the living virus, in the lab of uh, Zheng Li Shi, a woman at the Wuhan Institute of Virology who runs the lab at, uh, that studies coronaviruses there. And she announced that quickly. She said, I've got a virus, the genome of a virus that's 96.2% similar to this, and it comes from a, from a horseshoe bat in Southern China. So that was a form of evidence, not definitive evidence, but form of evidence suggesting that this virus probably can, comes also from a horseshoe bat. But we still haven't found the virus that's 99 or 99.5% 90, similar to this virus. Haven't found that. So this virus can't leak out of a laboratory unless it's been in a laboratory, right? And maybe it's been in a laboratory, but there is zero evidence that it has. There is no positive evidence this was ever in a laboratory. And for instance, if it had been in the laboratory of Zheng Li Shi, she is in the business of publishing dangerous viruses that she finds. That's how she gets publication credits in journals that have high impact factors like nature and science. That's her career. That's how she makes a living. That's how she achieves success as it's measured in science by publishing dramatic findings of new viruses. Didn't ever publish this virus or anything closer than 96 points. So you can say, well, you can say she's lying, okay? She told me she never grew this virus in her lab. She told John Cohen of the journal Science she never grew it in her lab. She told uh, Jane Chu, a Chinese journalist who spent many, many hours with her, that she never grew it in her lab. People can still say, well, Zheng Li, she is lying. She could bring out a wheelbarrow of all of her lab notebooks and say, these are all my lab notebooks and there's no sign of this virus there. People could still say, well, she's lying. So where does why that end? Important? David, why is it important one way or another for us, or is it important one way or another for us to know, given yeah. that it's out? It is very important for us to know, if we can, where it came from, because knowing that is, is a, a step toward preventing future spillovers of the same sort of virus from the same place. Another way of answering your question is two reasons why it's important. First of all, if you believe in the natural origins explanation, you are saying that we all have a, a portion of responsibility for this because we all do things that cause impacts on the natural world that bring wild animals and the viruses they carry in contact with humans. You know, it's not just a matter of do I eat bats or do I eat raccoon dogs or bamboo rats. If you have a cell phone, if you have a computer, you are a customer for the mineral coltan, which is mined in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo to make tantalum capacitors. And your proxies there are men and women who are digging in the dirt there to dig up that coltan. And what are they eating? Well, they need protein. Are there grocery stores in the, in the forests of the Eastern Democratic Republic Congo at the coltan mines? I don't think so. I wanted to go. I haven't been there yet, but I'm pretty sure there aren't. And those people are forced to eat bush meat, wild animals. So we all own a share of this. That's the natural origins hypothesis. If you say it leaked from a lab, you're saying it's not our responsibility. We didn't do this. She did it. They did it. It's their fault. And you're also saying, if you believe in natural origins, we need more science. We need more sampling. We need more experimentation. We need more study. We possibly even need gain of function research. And if you believe in nefarious origins, you're saying we need less science. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna- so Those are big differences. We're gonna open this up to questions in just a few minutes. Um, and, and before we do, um, the, one of the big questions that's on everybody's mind, you 
and your scientists in this book essentially say herd immunity is not a thing. Um, you debunk the notion that some form of herd immunity will protect us all in from now into the future from this and perhaps similar viruses. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you real quickly, um, number one, why the scientists believe that's true. And number two, the big question that's on everybody's mind right now, which is how long and how will we behave? I'm not asking you, David Guaman, to give us the mm -hmm. advice on this, but you listen to a lot of scientists and you ask them this. So yeah. you understand what I'm asking here, right? Right. So I go into the subject of herd immunity in my chapter entitled Four Kinds of Magic, mostly illusory magic that didn't work against this virus and couldn't work. And one of those four kinds is herd immunity. Um, I go into the, a bit into the history of it and it comes from veterinary science and, and um, animal husbandry. If you have a herd of a thousand cows, a closed herd of a thousand cows, and a viral disease comes in and starts infecting them and it kills 300 of your cows and another 600 catch it and then recover and are permanently immune to that virus, then you've got 100 cows left that are still susceptible. They have herd immunity in this very limited sense. The virus is going to have a hard time finding them because they're scattered. 100 cows scattered in this herd of 1,000. What was 1,000? 300 of them are gone because they're dead. And the other 600 are resistant, are immune. So the virus peters out, the spread slows down, and ultimately it dies out. It disappears because it can't find those remaining susceptibles. That's herd immunity. But if you say, well, I'm going to replace those 300 cows I lost, and you bring in 300 fresh cows that have never been exposed to this, boom, now the virus can find susceptibles again, and it starts to circulate again. So that herd immunity only exists if your population is closed. You have it's a closed population. Right. Yeah. So there is only one closed population of humans on planet Earth, and that is the entire human population mm -hmm. of planet Earth. And so a lot of people would have to die and others would have to be exposed and permanently immunized. And we already know that this virus is capable of evolving around immune, naturally acquired immunity and um, vaccine acquired immunity. This virus laughs at the notion of herd immunity. And as I say at the end of that section, so you can say um, herd immunity, but Herd immunity is like the immunity that you have if you walk out on a golf course in the middle of a thunder and lightning storm. Chances are that the lightning is going to hit the other guy or a tree. But if it hits you, you're not going to feel immune. Well, that brings us to the one of the big questions that's on everybody's mind right now, which is you. one of the lines in your book is a virus will always and continually mutate, this virus, I think you conclude, your scientists conclude, is going to be with us in some form or some mutated form, certainly for as long as any of us are alive and future generations probably. Mm -hmm. What do your scientists end up thinking that implies uh, beyond vaccination in mm -hmm. terms of the ways that we ought to behave? All these audience is generally like us, it's older people, people who are by their age grouping supposed to be more vulnerable. Most people have family members who are younger. As you know, there's an ongoing huge debate about how long we're gonna live as though we're in the middle of a deadly contagious virus. What do your scientists end up telling you about how they're gonna behave and what do you think? The consensus among them is that it's highly, highly unlikely that this virus will ever be cleared from the human population. Um, never say never, but it's almost unimaginable that we could eradicate this virus from the human population. And if we did eradicate it from the human population, we could become reinfected because we're now uh, half of our white-tailed deer in Iowa are carrying this virus and spreading it among themselves. This is a virus not just adapted to humans, but adapted to a number of different kinds of mammals. Mink, mink farms in, in Denmark and in the Netherlands, 
had this it's virus like sweep, massive culling, right? sweep through. Yeah, the virus infecting them, spreading among them, killing the, some and causing the culling of others. So, so mink farming has ended in Denmark and, and the Netherlands, as far as I know, or it very soon will. Um, so the virus is always going to be there. It's going to be somewhere and not just in its original reservoir host, probably a bat in southern China, but it's going to be in the forests of Iowa. It's going to be uh, in the moors of, of um, Denmark, where the feral mink are running around. It's going to be there. Uh, so how do we deal with it? Well, we deal with it by vaccinate, 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 keep improving our vaccination, keep trying to persuade more people to get themselves vaccinated. And we've seen that that doesn't that doesn't pre prevent you from having a case. You know, I had five shots and I got a case in mid-September. That's where I was uh, going to go next, right? You, but it, you but it wasn't a very bad case. It wasn't, I'm, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to the hospital. I wasn't a, on a ventilator. I was very grateful that I had had those, those vaccination shots, including the, the latest bivalent Omicron booster. I had had that before I got sick. Um, so it's going to happen. It's going to keep circulating, especially circulating in places where people are not vaccinated at all. And it's going to keep killing people. The notion that viruses automatically evolve toward being less harmful is the most polite word that comes to my mind is baloney. Um, it's just not true because that's not the way natural selection works. As long as this virus continues to be very capable of transmitting, it doesn't care whether the people who have already transmitted the virus to someone else doesn't care whether they die or not, because that doesn't go onto the natural selection scoreboard. And, and this fairly reliable, well-informed guy named Tony Fauci reminded me of that himself during our interview, during my interview with him. He's, he, he, he channeled the virus for a while and he said, you know, say I'm this virus, you know, I'm a really nefarious, insidious virus. And I don't care if I'm killing people as long as I keep transmitting. That's what I'm, that's what I'm built for. That's what I'm reinforced for. That's how natural selection is shaping me. As long as I can keep transmitting, I don't care whether I'm killing one person in 100 or one person in 10, doesn't matter. Well, Susan, there's a, there's a gloomy note to switch to questions on, but uh, why, don't you, why don't you let us know what sure. the questions might be? Yeah, Cynthia, thank you. I think you were starting to you know, ask uh, the first question, which um, David, you've been responding to, which is how and when do we think this will end? or at least become less concerning, especially to older adults. And I heard you say vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. Um, is there, in, under that heading, is there anything else that you would say? There's, I wanna add, I wanna add something to the question Susan just asked you, David, which is we haven't, and again, we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we haven't talked about masks and the ongoing debate. You will see on, on social media, for example, the line, if everybody would just mask all the time, this thing would be over in a month. Um, so your, your response to that assertion as well, please. I think masks are very important, but I think that's too simple. If, the, if everybody wore masks, everybody wore masks for the next month, this thing wouldn't be over. Um, it, that would certainly help to slow it down but it wouldn't be over. It's not gonna be over. It's not ever gonna be over, over, over. Um, but it's gonna be a lot less damaging if, if we use the tools that we, we have, and that includes masks, that includes social distancing, that includes sometimes closing economies and closing schools. I know the kind of information we're getting now about how damaging closing schools has been to our students. I see that and I take that very seriously, I've got, that's, that's not to be taken lightly. And I knew from the beginning when this thing started, I, I, I remember saying to myself, okay, this is gonna be a real clash between civil liberties and public health. And it is, and that's, a, that's just a, that's a conundrum that we have to accept 
it's it's always going to hurt in some ways. Finding the right balance between civil liberties and, in, and I include in that you know open economies and open schools and public health. And no matter what we do, there's going to be some pain, some damage, some hurt because this virus is just that good. Um, I want to ask one additional mass question, because even in a place like the Bay Area, where there tends to be less hostility toward masking and more just general acceptance um, and, and widespread use of masks, you flew, you got COVID flying to Washington and back, where you masked the whole way there and the whole way back, mm -hmm. took them off very briefly. Where I'm heading is the, the long-term question that a lot of us are having, the arguments we're having with our friends and our, and our children. Um, are we masking forever? Are we expecting to go into grocery stores and crowded places with masks on till the end of time? Is this um, a sort of a useless gesture? What are we looking at? Again, I'm not asking you, David Quammen, I'm asking the bunches of scientists that you've spent the last couple of years talking to, mm -hmm. what do they think about that? Um, they think, uh, as Dr. Jha, who is now, if I recall correctly, the, the chief advisor on this, uh, has said that masks are a tool. They're not the absolute tool, they're not the only tool, uh, but they are a tool that has, that has its value and has its place. So there may be times when such and such um, a country or such and such an area within the country is having a big surge of COVID-19. Might be time to mask up for everybody to mask up for a while and get through that. Partly um, because there is validity in that old phrase that we heard from the beginning, flatten the curve. Let's don't have any more cases of people with acute COVID because our hospitals and the ICUs within our hospitals are already full. And anybody who gets sick now is not going to get optimal health care. So it's the wrong time for us to rely on some notion of herd immunity that we can just go through this, you know, and, and it's the survival of the fittest and let the old people die and the people with secondary conditions die. And then we can all, the rest of us, we can continue going to school and going to the supermarket without having to hassle with a mask. But just for the record, I hate masks. I hate masks too, but I wear them where necessary. I hate, I hate ride, riding airplanes with masks, but I do it. Um, so if you have a box of N95s, each of which is still in its sealed cellophane wrapper, don't throw that box away. But that doesn't mean you have to wear a mask to the grocery store tomorrow. Just be prepared that we may need those masks again in acute situations. Is that responsive? Is that an answer? I think so. Susan, more questions on your yeah, list? Definitely. Um, there are two more questions. Um, I'm going to go with the, the second of the two is I, in looking back at January 20th, I mean, January 2020, and um, how the administration responded, can you, can you say for, in a forward way, what would be the best national response? If we get, if, I mean, as we go forward. Literally in a, in a four word way, that's challenging to me. <laughs> um, four word. Forward, not four words. Forward. I know, but I want to, I want to try the first way first. <laughs> yeah. That's um, good. Yeah. <laughs> no narcissistic baboon president. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's the four word answer. There's four right? words, right? Um, we need surveillance um, to protect us in the future against this virus and against the, the next one. Um, we need surveillance going on at the points where animals and humans come into contact, at the points where spillovers can happen. We need sampling of people um, who are in uh, positions where they might get infected with a new virus, even if they don't feel they have been, even if they feel healthy poultry workers. Uh, we need to persuade poultry workers um, to be giving blood samples so that their blood serum can be screened for the possibility that they have picked up avian influenza working in a poultry operation where they've got 200,000 chickens outside somewhere and 
a pond that they drink from and wild ducks coming in occasionally and pooping in that pond. We need to be surveilling situations like that and, and lots of other point of contact situations, humans in, con in contact with wildlife so that we can, we can know about the next dangerous spillover almost before it happens. And at least before the next outbreak happens, where suddenly, you know, 10 poultry workers and 10 of their family members are in respiratory crisis and, and five of them have already died. We need to spot these things before we get to that point. Because if we leave it to that point, then one of those family members or one of those poultry workers is gonna get on an airplane. So you're basically saying we need to construct a society that understands this phenomenon and anticipates yes. it. Understands the seriousness of it, understands the cost benefit, yeah. the cost benefit balance of preparedness versus not preparedness of civil liberties versus public health. Yes, we need a society of children and adults who understand this a whole hell of a lot better than than now. And so, you know, somebody somebody should start training some really careful, scrupulous science writers, I suppose. <laughs> Susan, do we have time for one last quick question with? Um... Yeah, well, there, um, Cynthia, there is one more question in the chat and then we can, if you have any other final questions. And I don't know, David, if you wanna um, say more on this, but your opinion about long COVID. That's what I was gonna ask about. Okay, great. You know, I'm not gonna say much about that because that's a medical question. And I do, uh, you know, I. I do enough channeling of molecular evolutionary virologists without being one of them, but I spend my days, my weeks, my years following them, studying them. Uh, long COVID is a medical question that I just, um, I, I just don't feel qualified to answer. I've never particularly researched it. I've focused on the virus itself and left the very important um, dimensions of this thing, the public health crisis, the medical um, crisis, the political dimensions. I've left those mostly to other people writing other books. Okay. Okay, Cynthia, back to you if you have other questions. I just want to ask if you're, how you're feeling now. The last time we talked, you had COVID and that wasn't very long ago, right? Yeah, I'm feeling fine despite the occasional <laughs> chuff. You know, I tested, um, I tested negative over, or tested positive over the course of 19 days. In the middle of that, I had a classic case of Paxlovid rebound. So I got this thing, I felt really crummy for two days, like I had a, a bad cold or a sinus infection and an earache. Started taking Paxlovid, felt better immediately. I qualified from Paxlovid because I'm so damn old. That's a, a secondary condition. Um, and uh, and then after five days, I started testing negative and I tested negative for four days and I was ready to resume my book tour. Um, and then I tested positive again and tested positive then for five, four, nine for another 10 days. Mm -hmm. But now that's two weeks, 10 days or two weeks ago. Um, I feel fine. If it were ski season, I'd go skiing. Um, <laughs> If it were golf season, I'd play golf, but it's in between. It's the season in in Montana where you brush the snow off of the leaves and then you try and rake up the leaves and leave the snow behind. <laughs> let there be snow. Let your knees carry you skiing and, and let you remain healthy. Thank you very much for being with us, David. It's You're always very fun welcome. to talk to you. <laughs> thanks, Cynthia. Thank you, Susan. And thanks, yeah. Al. Great yeah. to be part of this. Thanks well, it, it is wonderful, and I just want to remind people that we will be captioning this conversation and posting it on YouTube, and generally that happens within a week's time. We will send it up to UC Berkeley News and see if they want to make a podcast out of it. I think it's um, incredible information, incredible framing, and a an most amazing book, which I think you can't see as I put it up here. <laughs> But it's a great read. It really it's is. a very important read. And yes, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Hold Dave. up the book. They always tell you, hold up the book. That's right. <laughs> You're learning how to get it in the camera. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you both. Thank you, and Susan. Thank everybody for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.